Hey guys, this is episode 60 of Around the Coin. This week we covered the Floyd Mayweather Pacquiao fight. In the introduction, Faisal joined us back in the show. My first company, Zing Checkout, was acquired this past Tuesday by Big Commerce. Then we dove into a few topics here, the Tesla's new release of their in-home batteries. We talked about Circle raising $50 million and what they're going to do with that and how it can affect the world. Then we dug into Bitcoin for a while and the implications of the Western Union partnership. And we ended with kind of an abstract conversation about investments, both the typical and atypical investments. And we each talked about our portfolio allocations. Very interesting show today. Hope you enjoy. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, leave them on the bottom of our show notes, show notes or email us directly. Thanks. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of Around the Coin. Uh, we have the three amigos, Faisal, Brian, and myself, Mike, here. This week, we're going to be talking about Tesla. We're going to talk about Circle and Bitcoin, but we'll cover a few topics uh, in the beginning here to kind of get started. Number one, having Faisal back on the show is astonishing and incredible. And, and Faisal has been struggling with some health issues. So Faisal, uh, from Brian and I, yeah, welcome back. Thank you. It's, it's, it's great to be back. Missed you guys a lot. Missed everyone else. So uh, glad to be back here. Yeah, Wonderful. definitely. Um, so last night, today is Sunday, May 3rd. Last night was the Floyd... Uh, Floyd Mayweather Pacquiao fight, which on the topic of money, as we alluded to pre-show, made a shit ton of it. I think uh, the estimated revenue earnings were uh, a third of a billion dollars that they made in one fight, which is just <laughs> absolutely astonishing. And that's official numbers. I mean, all the other side bets and gambling and Vegas and all the Indian casinos, I don't think anybody can really add up what was really involved in this. It, it's mm -hmm. It's really a billions of dollars around the world. Is it, it isn't it regulated? Like isn't it regulated? Uh, in what uh, way? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's my, you know, I'm being na yeah. naive over there, but I thought the whole gambling thing in the in Vegas was all regulated. I uh, So maybe we're talking the undocumented bets, right? Yeah. What, one thing Perhaps, I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think the, the real winner, though, uh, subsequently, as I found out last night, was Uber. Because what happens on these pay-per-view fights is that everyone go. you have like 10 or 12 people get together at one living room, right? They're all, get, all friends yeah. get together and they'll buy the show because it's $100. So just 30 minutes prior to the start of the event, Uber is on 6x surge price in Santa Monica here in California. And I realized that everyone is going to uh, a friend's house to watch the event and paying six times more on Uber. So I feel like Uber may have even made more in the fight. Than, so that's good. Uh, that's that's called free, mar free market dynamics, right? <laughs> Oh, that sure is. I, I know people that had seven, eight televisions and they loaded their house up with people like, you know, a house party, 150 people. It was craziness, craziness, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. making their hundred dollars back and then some. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Fun stuff. Um, uh, so another another piece of news is that uh, the first company I started, I founded with Nate Stewart, who had been on the show previously, and we'll look to have him back, uh, was acquired. Zing Checkout was acquired by Big Commerce, officially announced on Tuesday of this past week. So congratulations and, uh, there, Mike. Yeah. Congratulations. Congrats, congrats to journey. Nate, really. Um, you know, it was a, a fantastic uh, run, and, and, and they have huge, bright futures ahead of them uh, at Big Commerce. Really okay. to integrate web point of sale with you know, the, the online retail experience. And let's call this the way it is. Nate stuck with this and you know how hard it was to stick through this, through all of the competition, the lack of interest amongst a lot of the investor community. Uh, you know, uh, this is a good success story of just having a vision, staying with it, building a, a really tight workable team. And, um, some of it being at the right place in the right time, you know, uh, it can, it's congratulations all. It's yeah, really. So we'll look to have Nate on, um, and kind of give us details of the acquisition, which, which would be really interesting. It's basically understanding, um, you know, when and, and why they decided to do, uh, or kind of proceed with an acquisition, what their steps were, how they actually reached out to other companies and got quotes and how they leveraged those, uh, those bids to, to get the best possible so offer. So I know the story, but I don't want to spoil it. Oh, you were privy to it, right? 
Yeah, I, Nate, 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 and I talked for a few hours uh, before the acquisition, and, and uh, it's an incredible story. So I think listeners would learn a lot from hearing it. So we need to bring Same. Nate on uh, on the it. mic, right? Yep. So I think he, I, I chatted with him. He's just getting approval from Big Commerce, and then we'll get him on and get the get the breakdown. So if you're thinking about how to sell a company, or if you're running a company, and an acquisition might be in the future, definitely a show you're going to want to catch. So, uh, so let's dig in. We have four topics today. Uh, the first is kind of an interesting, uh, an aside to the overall vision of Tony Stark. I mean, Elon Musk, which is Tesla's announcement of the three K three thousand dollar Powerwall unit. And essentially, what this is is a battery that goes in your house that captures solar energy and energy from the grid, and it allows you to run on that. And I think what Tesla was thinking here is, look, we spent. 10 years building this amazing battery technology, it'd be a shame to only leverage it in transportation. Um, and Elon being Elon launched a whole nother division in Tesla. I feel like he has <laughs> limitless time or <laughs> well, limitless I think attention it's also, to, to launch these new programs. It's also fair to say that, you know, he has Solar City, which he runs, and uh, it's all sort of uh, gelling the components together. I mean, the battery factory that he's putting up, I believe somewhere in the U.S., I forget where, it's going to be one of the Reno. most... Reno, uh, uh, Reno, Nevada. Yeah, probably one of the most advanced yeah. in the world. And, and it's essentially that his battery is is, is the key here. Um, Mike, you want to give us the quote that he gave us? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, so, so Musk was interviewed when they launched this in the press conference. And Tesla has very... Um, they have a reputation for being very blunt and very to the point, which they gain a lot of respect for. They don't kind of dodge questions. They're very transparent. They open sourced all their patents. And Musk says in a press announcement uh, upon announcing Tesla Energy, quote, the issue with existing batteries is that they suck, end quote. <laughs> They're expensive, unreliable, and bad in every way. And I just, I feel that that just encapsulated the the just frustration the that gist they of must the, feel internally. Yeah, the gist of the current yeah, battery right? industry, it's, right? It's it, like, boy, yeah, well, just, it's like night and day what they've done with battery tech versus what was going on uh, prior to Tesla. I mean, there was very little bit of leadership by some companies, but, you know, uh, what Elon did and you can kind of see his vision put together now. I mean, when he did Solar City and and um, and uh, Tesla, they look like desperately separate entities never to kind of link up. And, um, you know, in a Behind all this is the technology to make it all work, and it's the battery tech. And it you really can see is. it converging perfectly. Let me give you a couple of numbers here. He explained that 160 million battery packs could transition the power usage in the U.S. to renewable energy. And he says if they had 900 million units distributed worldwide, it would essentially transition our global consumption to clean energy. And that, to me, is just... That's phenomenal. You know, astonishing vision. Um, it's something that Musk really calls to other companies and says, quote, it's not impossible, it's something that we can do, but there's going to need to be contribution from other companies. Hmm. Uh, and it just... You know, it's the same thing in the automotive industry when he goes to Detroit for the, the global automotive conference. And he basically says, look, we don't want to be the only car manufacturer producing electric, electric cars, right? We need other companies to, to do this. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's an amazing thing to have, have him in the workforce. Well, you know, you like know it's really interesting. I, I went and uh, test, uh, test drove a um, Mercedes-Benz all-electric car. And, uh, you know, I've been in Teslas a lot. And I was blown away by how far behind Mercedes-Benz was. I mean, their car really only has 75 miles before it needs a, needs a charge. And then some people juice it up to 125, 150. But the car was extremely utilitarian. It was not, you know, at least a Mini Cooper, you, you feel like, I would have loved if they took the Mini Cooper and made it electric. There is no reason why they couldn't yeah. do that. But well, you know, there's a, there, there is a utilitarian car. There is a whole was, new industry that is actually taking all the classic cars and converting them to electric, uh, from the Cobra Shelby to the uh, oh my gosh to to the uh, you know the vintage of Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, it's a huge, huge industry now because those cars can. I mean, they don't have that you know that. Uh, gas guzzling noise that you know all the classic muscle cars have but they will rip any car out in a straight quarter mile run you know i mean just just rip them out yeah well electric motors i mean if you've ever been in, on uh well, i don't know what it's called the warp drive on the new teslas oh insane mode uh, oh my <laughs> I, everybody i've ever seen 
I love this sitting in a car and watching people go through that. It's it's uh, quite unlike any experience because have you done it? Have you been in this? Yeah, I've done oh. it dozens of times. Uh, been addicted to it. <laughs> you know, there's an there, you, there, Tesla, Tesla, you know you'd be surprised to know there's an entire industry that banks on just that mode, that insane mode, and a proper placement of the audience and the go uh, you know the GoPro four camera, and they have made oh, tons yeah. of money on YouTube just by putting those videos up. Oh, I can oh. tell you, I, it, it, I've seen, and it's even older people really dig it. I mean, I, I'm, I've seen the oldest person I've seen in a car is about 87, 88 years old, a gentleman who, um, you know, he was a test pilot at one time. He's a really techie guy, but, you know, he hadn't been in something that fast in a long time. He said, this blows away any jet plane I've ever been in, just because the acceleration is so instant. Uh, you're getting to 60 in like less than, I don't know, half a second or so. I don't know. It's a ridiculously small amount of time. And um, it, 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 it's it's invigorating, you know. Uh, it doesn't kind of throw your head back, though. It's just, it's so fast, you don't even have time for the momentum to move you that quickly. That's that's kind of the best way. Well, the only, says, the only the car. P85D. Yeah, the only. I was just going to say, it's uh, it goes 0 to 60 in 2.9 seconds. Yeah. Whoa. It, and, and Which is. And let me tell you, th that first second, um, you, you you almost don't know what to think because you don't ever have that experience. <laughs> you you just you guys got to do it. Just, yeah, you, because you, Tesla, you, you, know, you know it came from that yeah, from the launch control mode that the uh, Nissan GTR had. You know, and everyone went oh yeah, gaga yeah. over that. And this thing seems to blow it up, and you know, no noise, and oh you just God, like floor so it. It's instant. I mean, it's instant. You know, there's nothing between yeah. the, between the wheel and the motor. So. Uh, Fantastic. Let, stuff let me indeed. ask you this though, like from a higher level, what is the what, why are we so obsessed with the zero to sixty? Is when do you ever practically need to go to zero to sixty uh, quickly? You know, you know, on the regular course, is it a human? Is it an innate feeling of just going? It's a fe it's a feeling quickly? of power. It, it came about in the nineteen fifties, uh, pr primarily with drag racing. So the whole thing in drag racing was obviously sixty second uh, trials, thirty second trials, and uh, the whole idea was well, the quarter quick, mile, right? The could you get mile. the torque? Yeah, quarter mile. Yeah, and and how quick could you get the torque up? Um, and nitro was obviously the way to do it. And I used to be around racing as a kid, and nitro racing is just Sunday, Sunday nitro. You know, uh, <laughs> these race race drivers were just incredible guys. I mean, they were like they were like the hackers of that era, fifties uh, and sixties. They just knew their machinery inside and out, and they were optimizing and optimizing. And um, I got to sit in a drag racer. Uh, it, it was the only uh, passenger one they had. I mean, it was an official race car, but it was mostly for rides. When I was a kid, and I was blown away. But the Tesla is not even in the same category um, as far as the sort of you know, speed. It, it, reminds, Nitro is loud. it reminds me when <laughs> Brett loud. King was about to buy his Alfa Romeo, he was almost, almost convinced of buying a Tesla, you know. So, Brett, if you're listening to the show... Um, Should have gone for the test, my friend. Should have gone <laughs> you know, for the, the test. The, the, the big problem, uh, I think, with the the acquisition of a Tesla is where you live and what you're going to be doing at the car. If you're going to be d driving thirty to fifty miles a day, get a Tesla. I mean, you know, it's free energy ultimately if if you're using the superchargers, et cetera, and um, it, it it definitely pays for itself quite quickly. If you're going to be driving two hundred and fifty miles a day, it's tough. It's really tough. I mean, where I live in Southern California, getting to LA is about, you know, 200 miles around, you know, and... Uh, but then you get, get into the range anxiety and all that stuff, right? Yeah, it, it really, for it to be, I think, useful for people who are commuting, especially in Southern California and parts of uh, tri-state area in, uh, back east, uh, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, you need to have 350, 400 miles to give you that feeling that you can go and not worry about it to get home and back. I mean, like I think about it is if I go to like Santa Barbara or something, uh, which is much more Northern, I'm going to have to find a cafe or something where there's a supercharger and kind of do something with my kids for a while, you know, and I got to think about, you know, what are the logistics of that and how do I get from point A to B and, you know, will the car be ready? It's things like that. I have friends that drive to Vegas all the time in their Teslas. And fortunately, uh, they've optimized it so that you can pretty much do it um, in uh, in one run. But uh, you have to go to a hotel that has a, a supercharger if you want to use the car again in a few hours. You know? Struggle is real. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I'm waiting for the solar Tesla. So you Yeah, man, that's, that's, the, that's the next 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 level. It's coming. It's well, coming, yeah, I'm solar sure. cells need to you know, we, we we're going to see much development in solar cells. Battery tech hits a wall after a while. I, I think uh, once we get into nanoparticles, we might get a really big leap. Uh, but uh, solar cells really need to be more, much more optimized. And I think we're on that plan. But you know, we're a bit a bit a ways away. Unless you know, Elon's holding some secret uh, secret. Yeah, card. I'm sure he is. Yeah, if we've noticed probably. any trend. It's just uh, <laughs> an update away, I tell you. Just an update uh, away. Just one update. Yeah, I know, right? It's one tweet from his, I feel like his Twitter account personally is the no, uh, no, company I, release. No, I think it's, for- it's, it's, you know, when the next next Tesla car comes out and everyone's going to say, oh, bummer, man, I didn't have this. And he's going to tell you, well, all you have to do is hit the update button and you'll get the same features, you know? Yep, True. True, true. All right. So uh, the next topic we have here is Circle, a really interesting company, in my opinion, uh, raised, announced the, the raise of $50 million. And uh, Brian, what, you'd probably be best to give the description of what Circle is. Um, but before you do, I just want to say that they raised $50 million from Goldman Sachs and IDG. Goldman Sachs particularly is an unusual yeah, uh, investor. They're not a typical deal. VC firm, right? Um, so coming from them, you'd have to wonder what's the objective and what's the long-term play. Because uh, in and of itself, Circle is kind of an amazing story, taking what doesn't look to be apparently that innovative technology uh, and then really applying it in a very unique way to, to to grow. And that growth comes from different locations like the Chinese market and, and other markets. But Brian, for those who don't know, why don't you give the quick uh, Circle background? Yeah, well, Circle pretty much is a wallet uh, in, in the truest sense. Uh, what, what makes it somewhat unique is the, um, the, way they, um, the way they built the entire relationship with their customers. It's a little bit different than what you would experience with Coinbase. I wouldn't necessarily say they're direct competitors, but you know, they're, in, they're in the same realm. What I think is really unique about Circle is they're looking at themselves, I think, internally as a complete banking system. And I think that's where Goldman has their uh, their insights into this. I think they're looking at the long-term prospects of what what could this represent? What could it represent for, you know, we might call the, uh, the less banked, maybe not so much the unbanked people who are uh, maybe millennials who are less involved in banking. What, how would it work? How would it uh, uh, play out in that realm? And I think, as you pointed out, Goldman jumping into this the way they have um, is materially, on a, uh, materially important on a number of levels. I think level number one is I think they're officially giving an endorsement that Bitcoin and some of the ideas around Bitcoin are here for a much longer stay and the financial community in general is going to be embracing it um, on a number of different levels, on a commercial level and on a consumer level. I think you can definitely read in on that. Um, you know, but I think Faisal has some great insight on coin, right? Uh, didn't you um, have some contacts in uh, in coin? You know, one circle. Uh, sorry, sorry, circle. No, uh, no, uh, no, not in circle. In Coinbase, I did not in circle. But Coinbase, I, I, yeah. But, but I would say circle is more or less like. A, I guess the position, in my opinion, the positioning themselves as a PayPal. You know, a, a, a payment yeah, mechanism. A, a payment mechanism. They are a merchant processor. They are giving the FDIC insurance if you uh, hold your funds in U.S. dollars. So if you convert your bitcoins to USD, you know they're safe. Uh, so. Uh, I, I think I, I, I think I, I think Circle is the more conservative. You know, if in the Bitcoin world we can say this, they're the more conservative uh, startup. You know, they're they're looking at it from a compliance and a regulatory angle. They're they're not they're not shouting. Much more like a bank. Much more yeah. like a bank, and hence the interest from you know investment banks and so forth. Well, one thing Faisal I found interesting is that. You know, from Coinbase's perspective, they certainly brand themselves from the Bitcoin wallet. And that's great if you're all about Bitcoin. But I think the reality is people aren't and people don't really feel quite comfortable uh, in Bitcoin as they do in their own currency, say yeah. it's U.S. dollars. So what Circle, I think, is doing with this money, and I am a huge believer in this, is they essentially say, keep your value, your stored value in Bitcoin, Um and then exchange it or keep it in dollars and then exchange it in Bitcoin. Exchange so essentially you just make the, the bridge is Bitcoin. So people may not even know yeah, they're exchanging yeah. in Bitcoin I, I agree. if it's immediately converted, right? 
you know, well, it's I, more I, mental too. Like, like, yeah, I, mean, I don't. It's yeah. a mental thing because you're, you're still you're on subject Bitcoin, to, you know. I think well, you exchange on Bitcoin. So well, you I think they like, but they you like, exchange on Bitcoin, but you're not subject to the volatility of Bitcoin. Mm, I think which I like, think is people's ultimate concern. I think they like the concept of Bitcoin and everything Bitcoin, except the part where they have to keep their value in Bitcoin. You know, uh, I mean. The instant transportation, the semi-autonomous mode, anonymous mode, and sending money—it's instantly the you know the blockchain, everything else. But people are sort of hesitant in keeping their money as bitcoins. I mean, you know, if you if you got paid at three hundred and forty dollars about four months back, it's now two hundred and what I don't know twenty dollars or something. Yeah. So if they can keep that in USD and then and then convert to bitcoins instantly, pay out and pay in and so forth, I think that's where that's where most of the customers would be uh, very happy. If you look, there are a lot many companies coming up now that are backing their digital currency with gold, with gold contracts, physical gold contracts in a vault and so forth only because they want to convince the users that listen your money is actually in the gold contract uh, if you're if you're buying four hundred dollars worth of bitcoins with us we're actually going to be converting them into a four hundred dollars worth of gold and uh, whenever you want to trade or you know use it on a POS machine or, or pay a merchant or pay someone we will instantly convert you know sell that gold contract for whatever the amount is in usd and do the transaction uh, or the equivalent digital currency that we've issued, but the baseline value is always held in the, in in their opinion, the stable commodity which is gold. You know, and I think in Circle's case that may also be the true case that you know they want to hold it in USD rather than Bitcoins itself. Do you, do you think? Uh, let me ask you, Faisal. Do you think that's the inevitable play on Bitcoin? Is that it's it's in my kind of view, they're failing to hit critical mass in terms of stored value. People don't want to keep it in Bitcoin because yeah. it goes way up I, and way down. We've, and, we've, and frankly, uh, I bought it at a thousand. I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> you're, not, you're not the only one, Mike, but let me tell you. Know, the, yeah, there's a lot of people. The, yeah, the consolation I can give you is that you're not the only one. <laughs> Hundreds of people, uh, myself included, you know. Uh, you only lose money when you sell it. Exactly. <laughs> but the thing is that uh, I feel that, you know, we've been waiting for that use case. We've been waiting for that use case all the use cases are mostly on how the value transfer can be done. But there isn't a use case that really says, well, you know, not only the value transfer, but retain the value in Bitcoin. That has failed to prop up. I, I would love to use Bitcoins to pay for something that I have in USD, convert $40 worth of USD to Bitcoin, send it across, immediately the other person gets it and they cash out in USD or their currency of choice. But for me to hold yeah. my Bitcoins in the value uh, as a as a as Bitcoin, the currency, the money, just isn't there. And I feel that this Why? is some, and, and I feel that no one has been able to solve this. They've tried it. And let me tell you, the world is not biting it. Simple. No one's taking Why? it. Why no. try it? No. Though? Why even do it? What, you know, why not just look at Bitcoin as this is a medium for transferring value? Right. I want to, you know, Faisal, even you and I, right, have a tough time exchanging value in yeah, Pakistan. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. PayPal doesn't work. And like, why not just have Bitcoin be the medium for transferring value instead of storing value? I, I think if you look well, that's at that's the premise of Ripple. And, and exactly. And I was just right? about to say that. Brian just got it right. Exactly. Mm. There you go. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the thing is, there's that hacker nerd mentality amongst uh, financial nerds and just, you know, nerds and all that. You can somehow build an entire economy around this new algorithmic type of uh, currency, the ability to store value in, uh, in, a, in, in a calculation, ex uh, for example. Now, wh what that ultimately means is that the value that's stored in it as we're talking about it now has to have some sort of stability. And reality is if you look at inflation of currencies over you know, a generation, there's no stability in any currency. You know, uh, we're, we're really just sitting there with a uh, uh, money that is ultimately changing in its value. But with, uh, with Bitcoin, the volatility is on hyperdrive. The volatility is happening by the minute, by the hour. And I think that's too catastrophic for people on the short term to use it as a currency. Now, as a store of value, I think mathematically, unless somehow the Bitcoin economy completely erases itself, which I, I doubt with the billions that have been invested in it, that ultimately the long-term aspect is we'll do a show maybe uh, five years from now 
and we'll be scratching our heads why everybody didn't throw all their money in Bitcoin because it's going to so. ultimately go up. But it, nobody really, I mean, humans are risk averse when it comes to their final end product of their work energy, you know, their life force, whatever this you're putting so much hours in your day into something you want to have it tangible that you can buy something with it. But, you know, in reality, if you convert this into something that ultimately will appreciate, like perhaps a precious item uh, that will be valuable in the future, you know, that's an investment. That's not a currency. And so I see Bitcoin still today as really just a long term investment, not as a instant currency transaction mechanism for a number of reasons. But I do see the protocol perhaps being adapted so that it can become an instant uh, money transfer system. Uh, and obviously Ripple and, and Stellar and a few of the other um, initiatives are getting close to this. But I think there's a, a, a lot of psychological issues that are not being dealt with. I mean, money is a psychological construct. It really isn't uh, a, a manifesting in physical form, right? Because it's really digits at this point. And uh, when you study currency all the way down to the beginning of history, uh, you know, Sumerian ring coin, it was always a psychological aspect that we applied to it. And a lot of people get kind of wishy-washy when they're thinking about this. It's like, well, that doesn't really make sense. The bottom line is when you really do think about it, you're, you're kind of mentally putting an energy behind uh, something to hold what was your last month's worth of work or whatever, you know, your paycheck, whatever. And you have to say, so much of it I need to use today and so much of it I need to use uh, midterm and so much of it I'm, I'm trying to save. And I think that's where we are with Bitcoin is if, if I was somebody that was um, just coming out of college right now, you know, again, I don't want to give investment adv advice, but not putting a small percentage of your savings in Bitcoin for a long-term investment, I think would be foolhardy not to do that. Mm -hmm. But you also, uh, but, if, but, but also look short at short-term, it's not a good idea. But Brian also looked at all the traditional models that were, you know, that was super uh, successful, so to speak, at their launch time last year are no more. Everyone was oh, yeah. crazy about, you know, BTMs, Bitcoin, you know, teller oh, machines. Yeah. And look at everyone. Look at Lamassu, look at RoboCoin, look at the uh, BitAxis. Everyone's now going into the business of, you know, how can we get into more transactionary business rather than selling Bitcoin business? Uh, RoboCoin issue opened up their platform for remittances uh, sure. because they don't see money in hardware and, you know, exchanging dollars for Bitcoins that just isn't enough market, even in markets that are really advanced like the U.S., um, the one uh, surprise case for Bitcoin was in Nepal. I have a lot of friends in Nepal who yeah. were affected by the earthquake. And, you know, they are sending money ASAP uh, using Bitcoin because the 3G networks are up. The Internet is down in many places, but the 3G, yeah. 3G network is working fine. And they are exchanging value using that. But then again, cashing out, that's a huge issue in Nepal, you know. So again, when we look at the value transfer a, a, a mechanism, the aspects of it, of how fast we can transfer money, you know, perfect. But when we look at retaining value and then cashing it out, you know, again, huge issue it may it may be easy in in the us but in nepal where they really need the money it's not so easy see uh, for bitcoin proper i've always said there's two tent poles unfortunately and that is remittances and um, nano and micro transactions and thus far both elements are not quite gelling uh to the level that they should and yeah. most of it is because of but regulatory fear Faisal, yeah, what is what, like, what is actually happening in the world as far as remittances now? Are, is if I'm sending money back and forth, are there countries that are just exploding in terms of the changes that uh, you know well, cyber two, currency two has things are introduced? Happening. Two things are happening. Everyone loves the six hundred and forty billion dollars a year industry number. Everyone loves putting that yeah. on their spreadsheet and then the, uh, on their presentation slides and the pitches and sales decks. And then they say, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. if we if we can get point zero 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 one percent of that we will make 70 million dollars oh, the problem is the problem is the <laughs> incumbents are already there they're already doing instantaneous transfers companies emerging companies like world remit you know transfer y zoom remitly they're already disrupting to, to a limited level, it is a limited you know, uh, level, uh, the existing space. And let me tell you, 
the likes of Western Union, the likes of Money, Riagram, and the, and the big players, the incumbents are not sitting still. As it, it, you know, it's like an aircraft carrier. They will turn eventually. They will turn. They have to make a very calculated decision as to where, which you know, path they have to take. But they will turn. Uh, the small, nimble companies are turning, and you know, they're they're saying, "Oh, we're going to give you know Western Union a run for their money." Western Union, so, Western Union is going to make the fees go down to zero and put you out of business. You know, yeah. because they can do that. Western Union. And that's a great, that's a great example, right? We're looking at transition of legacy companies. And I think it's uh, apropos this week, just lightly tossed out there. Yeah, very Ripple lightly. And Western, very very yeah, subtle, Ripple and, uh, you know. Ripple and Western Union, we're just kind of experimenting it, with no, this no, no. idea. No, no, no. The word is quote unquote exploring pilot exploring, programs. You yeah. know? <laughs> and, and that was the shot that everybody was looking for. And a lot of people were caught off guard on how low key it was put out there because it's a big sea change. It's at, like you were you know, saying, that's, Pfizer, uh, that's the, the warning turning shot. around. That's the warning shot. Like I say in, in Hunt for Red mm-hmm. October, the U.S. is Reuben James <laughs> firing one across the Red October. You know, that's the it. warning shot. I tell you, yeah. you, you, you think Chris Larson and company is just it had to happen. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. Sure. And Western Union says, listen, we've looked at all the protocols. This one makes sense. Why? Because it's meant to transfer value no matter what currency it, it, you hold. It was it was almost like when they were building Ripple, they were thinking about American Express. I mean, uh, sorry, uh, Western Union and, you know, American Express travel checks too, but I gave a little secret there. But, um, you know, the, the bottom line is, intent. yeah, intent. Uh, the bottom line is, what does it mean? What does it mean internally? I mean, are they literally just going to flip a switch and instead of going through their bank channels, no, it just no, ripples no, no. out? No. So if you, ha- you have to look at the Ripple stack. So I think what it does is it takes anyone, anyone using a Ripple protocol to become part of the ecosystem. Now, prior to that, you had to make the entire stack, the entire stack compatible to be part of the ecosystem. In this case, just the settlements portion, the IOU portion, which is which is what the Ripple runs. If you just use that portion, if you're if you're using the Ripple protocol, you can become part of the ecosystem. So that means disparate systems, disparate banking channels, disparate countries, what have you, have a common denominator, which is Ripple. And moving money and moving value becomes a whole lot easier. What in, in simple English? You're removing the steps for correspondent bankings. You're removing latency from the network. You're removing hops from the network. Imagine sending a packet from New York, a simple way, TCP packet from New York to Singapore, you know, 18 hops. Imagine doing the same thing, two hops. What's more efficient? What makes more money? Definitely two hops, right? So that's the, sure. way, that's the way Ripple looks at it. That's the way Western Union looks at it. Hey, two hops, it's got to be cheaper, right? So, so, so who's impacted by this initially? I mean, if we were to look at this being mildly successful a year from now, who's going to be impacted the the, the fastest? Hard to say. I mean, I mean, what, the knee-jerk reaction would be to say SWIFT and the traditional banking correspondent networks. But I think the the logical uh, decision would be, I don't think so. Anyone's going to be impacted for what, at least one year. If it becomes immensely successful, the correspondent relationships, the, the, the money that correspondent banks used to make in in traversing your money, in proxying your money to other countries where they were making a good killing on it, is going to vanish because that hop is going to be eliminated. So I think it, the, benef- the, the benefit is obviously b- between the sender and the, and the receiver, but those middlemen in the middle are going to be suffering the first. Now, Faisal, was American? Uh, sorry, was Western Union really using correspondent banks, or were they using their own offices to move some of this money in some? No, no, they have, they have to use correspondent banks. That's so there's always a bank, no matter what. No matter where. No matter where. No matter where. Okay. No matter and where. that's part of the whole money transmitter. Uh, and uh, well, well, that's and the whole part. Of, that's the whole part of how the system the is. The remittance system is, works. The, yeah. the, the, the money transfer system works. Be it remittance, be it home remittance, be it business payments, be it loans. What the ledger system at present works like that. So I think by improving the ledger system, by taking the correspondent banking elements out, the middlemen out. Uh, you improve the efficiency of the system. When you improve the efficiency of the system, you increase profitability, you know? So what would the local uh, local authorities in different countries feel about 
in seeing the Ripple protocol on Western Union rather so, than a, so a local the, bank. I think it's the, I would give an analogous case. It's, you know, circa 1992. 192 or 93 novel was the you know the de facto choice for networking <laughs> you know yeah. and now you introduce you know something called tcpip and there's no more token ring there's no novel uh you know it, it, so it, it's just the addition and acceptance of a protocol it does not change the banking as it's done in any manner it's the same settlement except it's it's settlement with 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 the least amount of middlemen in it. So rather than sending money from Chicago to New York to a correspondent bank in London to a correspondent bank in, you know, let's say Mumbai and then to Delhi, it's now Chicago and Delhi, you know, settling with each other. Wow, hmm. wow. F Faisal, let me ask you this, uh, and this, this may be obvious to you, but uh, not to me. So Western Union, it keeps coming up, and I was just doing a little bit of reading on Western Union. In 2000, last year, they had $5.5 .5 billion in total revenue. Uh, the company is obviously massive. Um, maybe maybe this is more focused towards Brian since you tend to know everything about everything. But yeah, the you. value of Western Union, do you, do you guys look at it as the actual physical locations of the, uh, of the money transfer, essentially the ATMs of exchanging money, right? The kiosk you can walk up to. The fact that they have those all across the world and have a network that talks between those, is that is that what that prevents Western Union from being disrupted. Yeah, you 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 focused on the the biggest issue, and and this is where a lot of tech companies always fall flat because they're using the old Google model of less less people, more computers, and that's great. But there's certain things that you can't necessarily disrupt that way, at least not anytime soon. Certainly not in our lifetime. Yeah. You also and Faisal knows this. You ultimately have to have a a, a physical uh, depot location. Yeah. where you ha are going to pick up physical cash. Now, at some future date, this will all be an app. In some sense, it'll be on your smartphone and you'll just transfer money to the bills that you have to pay. Uh, and and there are some companies that are addressing that. But to, to get the entire you know world to move in that direction, it's going to be quite some time. You know, Even in Africa, when but, you look at M-Pesa. But look at this. You look at it. Look at this way. The calling card business is still very much here. Why oh, yeah. ask the diaspora, ask the blue collar workers, ask the illegal workers, everyone's using it. Uh, yeah. The taxi drivers of New York, the cabbies of New York, what do you think they do when they have to send money? Do you think? Do you really think they're going to sign up on Zoom and attach their account and use an ACH? No. They go to a Western Union. They go to the place where they hang out. It's probably a Western Union or a money grime agent. You know, the, the eventual utopian uh, wonder dream for the financial system is to go cashless society. It's not going to happen soon. There's a lot of cash, a lot, a lot of cash out there. And physical money still needs to go to some physical depot where it's exchanged as an IOU and cashed out somewhere else in the world. So I think the Western Union agent model is is going to stay. It's not going to be disrupted anytime soon. And one more thing, I want to make it you know sort of a moot point, but I think Ripple is looking at the ultimate win. And the ultimate win is to win with Western Union, with That's Western it. Union. Yeah. And I think with they're going to do it. And I think they're, going to I, do it. I think they're on the road, you know, and, and I, again, circling back about the physical locations, there's also a, a level of trust, you know, uh, in LA, when I go out uh, and, and I visit some friends, especially uh, uh, some that uh, actually are sending money this way, they go to specific Western Union offices, number one, because it's Western Union, number two, they just feel good about the people and they trust that the money's going to get there. And there's a lot of instinctual feelings that are going on because people are just predictable thinking, well, behavior, Brian. Predictable, exactly, predictable yeah. behavior. It's all about you know, behavior, you know. I know one gentleman who sends money uh, three times a week to his wife and uh, and and mom and dad uh, back in his home country, and he goes to a specific place with a specific uh, teller. He knows the guy's name. He knows his background. He knows his, the days he works. And that's the only person he'll give his money to. And he's been doing this for quite a number of years. And so some of these relationships are very much like banker relationships. Uh, you know, when I, when I was observing him interacting uh, with the, uh, the uh, person, the teller, I guess, he basically had shorthand kind of conversations, however 
things going. You know, isn't that going to die? Like, aren't we past that? Eventually. I, I mean, eventually, I been, eventually, eventually. Yeah, not, not, not yet. We're in the not morph- for this guy. We're on the not inter- for this guy. Yeah, for we're in the morphing stage. The old timers are not going to change. They're going to eventually die out one day, sad as, as it is, but it's going to happen. I'm, I'm being very blunt here, but yeah. it, it's, the, it's the millennials. They will slowly come into the workplace. They will slowly, you know, age. They will slowly. So we are, we are the transitioning phase. We are the transitioning, uh, you know, uh, generation, if you will. So we but, have seen both the cash and the digital side. Eventually, there will be a, a, a you know, a, a, you know, a generation that wouldn't know what a, what a physical currency mm-hmm. note is. Yeah, to, to, to some extent. But, you know, things never utopianize the way we think in technology. I love going back and reading old books about how the future is going to be from some incredibly brilliant individuals. And I think it's always going to be a lot more sloppier, a lot less clear cut. Um, I think once millennials wake up, some of them are going to wake up and say, you know, I'm, we all do this. I'm really a lot more like my mom and dad than I really wanted to be. I really do want to not live in the city the rest of my life. I really do want to have a house to raise my kids. I really do want to own a car. Every generation comes, you know, since the 1950s, every generation gets analyzed in the same similar manner. And it's always that they're going to somehow work in some kind of utopian setting where everybody's much closer to resources and they're on a public mass transit. But what happens, I think, especially with females when they're reproducing, right? When they're having kids, they start looking at protecting their young. They start looking at, you know, honey, I don't want to be in Greenwich Village. I don't want to be in Brooklyn. I don't want to raise my kids here. It's not like it's bad. It's just, I want to build a shield to protect my children. And as long as people do that, as long as people have those feelings, and I'm telling you, a lot of people who have not had kids before, they look at it and say, oh no, that's not going to be me. And mm-hmm. I've, I've now known basically three generations of people who said exactly the same thing. And then they became pretty much like their parents. And that's not a bad thing. It's a natural growth transition. It's just like we don't hopefully still act like we did when we were freshmen in well, high once, school. Brian, once we can genetically modify people to just have the traits and, and desires that we want, then we won't have to worry about that. Well, yeah, uh, the question no, is, I fully agree. Yeah, uh, the question Brian, is, me, uh, will me, it be outlawed that we can physically reproduce uh, outside? You know, I mean, yeah. you can get crazy about it. Oh, God. But, no, my point is this. People will always gravitate towards things that make them feel better, right? And I, I know that sounds very simplistic, but what happens is you look at, as some of the later, the, the older millennials, the people that are entering 35 right now and literally having kids and moving out of the cities and into the suburbs, they're doing things slightly different. But, you know, if you look at where a predominant amount of the money in the family is still being spent, it's being spent by the uh, the homemaker of the family, whoever that might be. I don't want to, you know, label it as the wife or whatever. But, you know, the bottom line is, a, a tremendous amount of money is being spent that way. And if you look at the relationships, and I'll use a traditional nuclear family that the wife makes with a lot of the people they buy from, their personal relationships. So you and I, uh, we're all guys here talking, and we talk about how we're going to nerd out on doing certain technologies. But in reality, if we have families, our wives are making a tremendous amount of our financial decisions. And to be frank about it, that's a good thing. Uh, they know the the guy that's doing the meats, uh, the, the meat market, the produce guy. They literally sometimes you go out and shopping. And you're like I was going out with a friend. They they, they um, never go out shopping because they're a startup founder and they don't have time. And he was blown away that his wife knew all the people and all the departments <laughs> and yep. and knew their families. And yeah, they but had they used these to know back in back when they go to the post office. They used to know all those. So I that's think right. there's just a natural desire to have. Human interaction doesn't necessarily need to there's be with a trust, people that you though. buy things from. The thing is, there's a trust, though. Uh, you know, when yeah. what, especially if, you know, somebody's really watching, and we're talking about eating uh, before the show, you know, they want to get a certain organic uh, diet and they want to get produce. They want to be able to trust that that produce guy really knows his stuff and he's really vouching yeah, for its it's all about sources. It's all about being content in your decisions. Right. Let me ask you this. Um to kind of reel it back on that point, I, I kind of got sucked into this article uh, here on TechCrunch. And one point they made was Bitcoin, or Coinbase rather, received investment from the New York Stock Exchange, USAA, BBVA, yeah. and the CEO of Citigroup. And they all claimed that in, you know, in January 2015, they made the statement, this year is the year of Bitcoin. And 
I tend to believe that if you have all these, you know, the New York Stock Exchange invested in Coinbase, right? So is that essentially choosing a favorite? And if Coinbase doesn't succeed, is that the, not the end, but I mean, that seems to be such a major bet uh, from these from these individuals that, like, can you look at Coinbase and essentially determine the future of the industry because of the, the individuals who contributed to uh, Coinbase's investment? No, well, uh, let you know, me let me let me give you my perspective, and I'll have Brian give his. Coinbase. I mean, let's look at all the players out there. Who are the more more quote unquote responsible players who have put up an equal amount of money, who have shown the yeah. financial discipline, regulatory acceptance, compliance acceptance, and so forth, uh, who are not. Uh, mavericks, so to speak, but understand that this is going to be a slow, drawn process. You have to win it one battle at a time. Those are the companies like Coinbase. Those are companies like Circle. I mean, they're not going to be, you know, fly-by-night operators, you know, who've just hacked up some software in, 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 in a couple of weeks. I have nothing against them, but, you know, banks are conservative by nature. They will not, they will not act on an impulse unless it's obviously some derivative market or something but you know they will not act on an impulse they will slowly and surely and they're not betting on coinbase they're not actually betting on the on all the things that they are used to compliance legal uh you know advisory services looking at the market taking a cons- you know cons- conservative approach and so forth i think that's why they're betting on coinbase had there been other players like this i'm sure they would have had their investments too yeah, I, I think Faisal is right on target. And I think there is limited um, space. I mean, you have Circle, you have Coinbase. You know, I don't think you have too many more that are uh, in that same realm at this point, you know, in, in that in that category. And I don't want to say that um, Coinbase is going to be the canary in the coal mine scenario. I, I don't, you know, there's always yeah, that element. Yeah, I can element. see how you would say that, though. Yeah, <laughs> You know, because and it's not that they're doing bad and not that the management is uh, terrible. Quite the opposite. I think they're doing well, incredibly well under the circumstances of where Bitcoin has been uh, this last year. And I think um, they have incredible support. But I do think the market's going to widen. And I think it's going to widen beyond Bitcoin and more into blockchain. And, you know, we talked about Bitcoin earlier and, and, and the limitations. I'm I'm much more positive, always has have been on what blockchain represents and how a public ledger, a uh, confirmed open public ledger, can really change things. And I think that's part of the investment in Coinbase. And I think at some point, and I'm not speaking about any inside information; it's my impression. At some point, Coinbase will b- present itself to the world much more like a blockchain company than just a Bitcoin company. And I think that change is in the winds. And I think. Um, what we are talking about with Western Union is mm. an example of blockchain, although it's not the blockchain I'd like to see. You but know, Brian, uh, it's, it's the same thing. You know, two years ago, three years ago, blockchain, Wall Street, Bitcoin, Wall Street, eh, meh, you know, okay. Oh, yeah. But then people start talking. The juniors start talking. The associates start talking. The seniors start talking. The partners start talking. And at some point in time, you got to say, you know, well, you know what? Let's take a look at it. A very conservative. Let's take a look at it in a very, very conservative manner. And I think that's what hap- that's that, that's what happened largely last year, and this year they said, you know, let's go for it. Let's let's go for it. Not too big, but let's go for it. Yeah, yeah, and and mm. and, and I think ultimately, when when you're looking at this from a perspective, if we were to invent uh, the credit card network or the bank ACH ne- network, the SWIFT network today, with current technology. What would it look like? It would look like the blockchain, pretty much. It'll look like Ripple. It'll look like Stellar. There's be derivatives and and variableness of it, but it would be essentially based like that. Mm-hmm. And and when you talk to senior executives at these firms, and you present it in that way, it, it's it's crystal clear where they have to be. And that's why the the whole notion of Clayton Christ, Christensen textbook disruption is really antiquated. There's no legacy company uh, in, in the top 500 companies that are asleep anymore. They're looking at their own self-disruption. And I think we're seeing that with Western Union. We're seeing it with uh, all sorts of banking platforms. Uh, you know, Brett King talks quite eloquently about this. Mm, you know, he has mm. great contacts within the banking world. When he started, they were so anti all, pretty much all tech. And now they're in, trying to lead in front of it. Yeah, and, now they can't get can enough do? of fintech. Can't get enough. And there's some key banks like uh, BV, uh, BVVA, BVA Bank, yeah. uh, 
Yeah, yeah, and and uh, and a few others uh, that are really looking at this. Uh, Australia is doing incredible work uh, with their banks. They have a, a much more homogenized banking system, and you know, I think it's a matter of time before we start looking at banking much more like a tech uh, aspect than a financial aspect, and investment and everything else. And I think it might change the problems that we have in some of the investment uh, uh, community, some of these micro uh, trading programs and, uh, you know, instant trading programs uh, really live within the fact that all information is not equally available, or at least not equally yeah. available at the same time. Um, yeah, super interesting stuff. Uh, Faisal, you and I talked a bit, a bit before the show about uh, Argentina and the effect that, and the, particularly this article, this is, Can Bitcoin Conquer Argentina? And, uh, and, and before we talk about Argentina, I just want to give you a quick a uh, story about uh, a couple guys that mm -hmm. we employ here at Home Hero. Mm -hmm. um, two of our engineers, uh, Matias and Javier, they live in Argentina. One lives down in uh, Buenos Aires, one kind of in the middle of the country. And they both, and I was astonished to learn this, but they both go to Uruguay for banking. They don't have any of their money, any, any value saved in Argentina banks. And when I talked to them about this, they, were, they said this is, the, this is the expectation. This is the norm. I mean, think that about that. People go to other statement. countries to bank. You know, think about and, that. And it just, it blew my mind. Going to, to, to know, another country to bank, huh? Yeah. And it's like, if you, if you describe a broken system, that's as broken as it can get, right? They took two days off to literally hop on a train and go to Uruguay. And it just reflects the sort of instability or the mistakes that the Argentinian um, you know, financial industry uh, has structured. They, they've, they yeah. are in, in, in obviously a pretty pickle, but you know, two South American countries, Venezuela and Argentina, classical cases where the flow of capital, the fear of flow of capital going outside the country is, has, and they've clamped down so much. If you send $100 to Venezuela, uh, as per Dilip Ratha, who's the chief lead economist on World Bank for remittances, quote unquote, you'd be lucky if the other side receives $10. How's that? I mean, officially, wow. Wow. officially, officially, if you send a hundred bucks, you'll be lucky. How, if, how is that possible? Uh, what, what's what's well, happening? Well, uh, all forms of clampdown and so forth. And then he cites, he cites very, very clearly when money gets, you know, when money faces a resistance, so to speak, money goes underground, money goes into suitcases, yeah. money goes, money finds a way to go underground and then snake its way across. The same thing is happening in Argentina. Bitcoin is not... Bitcoin just happens to be the natural reaction, the natural alternative that they have all reverted to. There is the official price of a you know dollar to Argentino pesos. There is the unofficial or the curb rate, and then which uh, and uh, and then there's the you know, which is called the blue dollar rate, and then there's the Bitcoin rate, uh, and there's a huge disparity between the two. So no one wants to own money and then you know be out of it. Uh, don't be too surprised if something like this happened in Greece in the coming months. You know? Yeah, I was just going to say, when we look at what's going to happen in Europe, I think um, it's actually pretty frightening. I mean, it, to put yourself in a position where uh, you're a retired individual and you have your money supposedly safe in a bank. Well, that is not true anymore. And, uh, you know, even we've never really seen this in modern society, even the bank runs of uh, the 1920s, etc. You know, you you had the money, but the bank failed. It's not like the money itself, the value of the money diminished. It's a, the, who held the money failed. Now what's going on with these negative interest rates is that if you're not spending money, you're losing money. And inflation was one way to injure um, hmm. uh, retirees. Uh, but now with the negative in interest rates that are pretty much appearing around the world, um, it's it, we're living in a very bizarre period of time. And I think it has a lot to do with well, it has a lot to do with this, the direction that all governments are taking with their finances. But uh, I think if, if Greek winds up, if the Greek economy winds up doing what it appears to go, going to be doing, um, some of the things Faisal was talking about is going to explode in Europe because I don't think it's just going to impact Greece. Yeah, I it, think it's going I mean, to impact in Argentina, all the Mediterranean. You know, they have a lot of uh, 
currency regulations. They have a lot of clampdown as to how many dollars you can hold, if you Flight can even capital. hold. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If even if you can hold them, I mean, I bet if you could provide your people with, let's say, uh, pay them in gold in some manner, fractional gold reserves, they would, they'd accept it. But the problem is, again, cashing out, they can't really go to their neighborhood grocery store and you know pay out in gold. The neighborhood grocery store will definitely accept one dollar or ten dollars, but they cannot accept a Bitcoin. You know, um, but they're using Bitcoin for uh, for purposes of uh, value transfer. They're making money. There are a lot of companies that are uh, now coming into this business. They're saying, listen, you know, we have legal, illegal, you know, gray channels where we will take the inflow of Bitcoins, we will give you the dollars, then we will take those coins and, you know, sell them on the exchange elsewhere in, in Europe and, and you know, uh, shampoo, rinse, repeat and so forth. So yeah. it, it is a serious situation. I mean, it's not a, it's not a pretty situation to be in. And, and to think of the fact that you have to go to another country to take yeah. your to, to take your thing. Well, I mean, that, 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 let me that, ask you, that can really, insanity. That, that, exactly. <laughs> Faisal, this would be interesting to hear from you. Why, why do you think Argentina takes, the, the government takes a stance against Bitcoin, right? And, and maybe I'm just deluded by the U.S.'s perspective, but is there is is there advantage to limit, to restricting it, saying the banks, no, quote, the no. banks refuse to work with Bitcoin well, so, and Coinbase? So, 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 flight capital, right? Uh, flight, flight, they don't, exactly, flight capital. They don't want Brian's, money Brian's, leaving Brian's, the country. Balance you know, of payments. So listen, uh, as a uh, the country of Argentina, you have two wallets. One wallet has all pesos. Pesos you can print. So I could print a billion or trillion pesos that have no value. But what the world really wants to see is how many dollars do you have? Because those you can't print. Those only the U.S. government can print. So, And that's how the wealth of nations is determined. How, how much how many, I mean, for, for, for all practical purposes, pesos is equivalent to toilet paper right now. But the U.S. dollar still holds a lot of intrinsic value. And they say, okay, how much, how many dollars are you holding? But if those dollars are, you know, fleeing away from the country, the government's wealth, the wealth of Argentina is being reduced. That's going to happen. But, you know, I believe that you should have an open system. You should try to fix it rather than clamping down on it. Prohib prohibition didn't do anything, you know, as far as alcohol was concerned you know, in, in the U.S. It, it certainly exists everywhere else where they've clamped it down. It's not as widespread usage as it would, would be otherwise. But the fact is that it's still there. So I think the clamping down oh. that they've done is, is, is you know, is short-sighted. It's, it's myopic. It's obtuse. It's a knee-jerk reaction to you know, how a typical economist would think. And they just have their heads in their sands, in the sand. You know, know. the thing we've learned about any um, market economy, especially a, a market economy really tilted towards a laissez-faire uh, capitalist economy, hmm. um, you know, there are a lot of derivatives of market economies. Some are really crony capitalism, unfortunately. Uh, I think when you truly have an open enterprise, laissez-faire attitude uh, that sparks business innovation, you don't need to hold anybody in. You don't need to hold any capital in. Uh, you, you're just bursting like a, you know, a wildflowers in, uh, in, in spring on a nice field. I mean, you don't, everything is just growing and, and it's growing rapidly. The thing is, when you start restricting any sort of growth and you're, you're taxing the heck out of it, that's a sign that there's a, 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 a serious illness within that economy. And it ultimately always ends, historically, it always ends bad. Uh, it always ends in revolution or war. And there's no other way that this stuff really works itself out because ultimately the, the prescription to fix it once it's gone too far Mm. is impalatable to the population. And people and have the, lost uh, their trust leaders. in the government. They don't trust their it's money with the... It's all about the trust. Yeah, yeah. It's and all they, about trust. And they don't trust yeah. their money with the government. So um, You know, and, and when you look at some of the Africa, African economies when inflation took off, I mean, imagine you Zimbabwe. had... Zimbabwe. <laughs> yeah, Zimbabwe. You had a million dollar equivalent of a million dollars in, in, in their capital. And then in the space of, what, seven days, it became Gone. worth a few, yeah. a few thousand dollars and a few hundred dollars. I mean, that's somebody's wealth. That's somebody's work uh, work product for maybe their entire life, their family lives, you know. And, um, you know, in the Western world, we pretty much don't have to think about this. But that's why in certain parts of the world, they have very conservative views about how they invest their money, where they put their money. And uh, if anybody had gone through the 1920s uh, uh, failures in the United States and bank failures and, you know, Wall Street failures, uh, you would also... We really respect their views on capital base. Um, 
You know, I remember um, uh, one of my friends, uh, great grandpas, uh, he used to sit down and used to show us what compounding interest really meant. Mm. And it would blow my mind as a young <laughs> kid, <laughs> let me, as let me, five-year-old. And let me ask that you doesn't guys. exist anymore. Well, no what is the, uh, out, of, out of the, you guys, you know, uh, disclose what you want, but it'd be interesting to hear. I, I've recently done some uh, research on investing and um, I have a little money saved up. I'm sure it's nothing compared to your, your money banks or Fort Knox that you guys have. <laughs> but what do you, how do you guys split your portfolio that you save? Is it in, do you guys tend to, and Faisal, it'd be interesting to hear yours compared to Brian. Do you, do you consciously reallocate the money you have saved and put, you know, 60% domestically in the U.S., 30% foreign? So, and then- uh, I am, Unfortunately, mine is, or fortunately, mine is all tied up here. So it's stocks, it's government bonds, it's real estate, and a little bit of commodity like gold. So that's the way it is, uh, and 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 it's and it's worked very well, uh, you know, in the long run, uh, because the U.S. is so competitive. I really wouldn't know where to start as far as investments are concerned. I may be a payments guy, but I'm so, certainly no investment guy. You know, uh, yeah, I'd, be, I'd be word, I'd man. be equally clueless like the guy yeah. next to me on the street. <laughs> it, I mean. It makes no difference having all this payment knowledge and then going for investments because I have no idea about you know PE ratios right. and all that stuff and 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 you know what to buy. So really, wouldn't know. Brian, do you do you put money in an ETF or mutual fund, or you, no. do you tend to do it all yourself I, I, or hire somebody? I, I, well, combination. I don't really believe in mutual funds because of the loads involved and 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 the fees. You're not really getting the raw stocks. I, you know, I do buy across a, a number of sectors, and sometimes I will be in and out of that. I would say to anybody, especially uh, people who are in tech, if they're not in real estate at the same time, they're they're really diluting themselves on a long term basis. Uh, whether it's commercial real estate, uh, mm. income producing real estate, uh, or their own home, even. Um, I, I think the travesty of the, you know, the real estate crash was it made home ownership and um, any real estate ownership become sort of like less, less tangible in people's minds. The reason for this is that ultimately the funk that's within the real estate market is going to clear. It'll clear much faster. It already has uh, than most people would recognize. And um, like people in the Silicon Valley area, I mean, I remember some friends I talked to in uh, 2009 and they said, well, you know, everything's turning upside down even here. I'm going to get out. I go, just hold on, hold on three, four years. Well, they're, they're holding on to 2015. Uh, sextupled their investment from uh, 2009. And it was the best investment they made even with their founder's shares compared to their founders' shares in a r- relatively great startup company that ultimately got acquired. Um, so I'd say that. Um, I'd look at farms. Uh, right now, I think if, uh, if, you're inv- uh, if you invest in farmland, uh, especially organic farmland, uh, you know, hothouses or, or uh, hydroponic farming, or like Faisal was talking about, investing in actual cattle or uh, income-producing trees. I invested in a few maple trees. Uh, avocado <laughs> awesome. ranches. Th- these things are, they sound exotic and they sound kind of hard to do. They're very simple. They're not confusing. And they're commodities that transcend what is going on, you know, at that particular moment. Yeah, in it's, time. Good to, it's good to think about it from, you know, you shouldn't be restricted to joining on Fidelity or E-Trade and throwing all your money in there. You I, know, you could, you could be literally buy a cow or invest in a wine helped, vineyard or, you know. Well, <laughs> people, I people need to eat, folks. Friends. People need to eat. Mm-hmm. I helped a lot of my friends because uh, I'm in the wine uh, country of Southern California. And one of the reasons I'm out here was because of wine uh, country investment uh, uh, products. You know, Avocado ranches, avocados are green gold out here. I mean, you put up an avocado tree. Brian, just, if someone wants to invest in an avocado farm, will you, will you, will you, avocado hear ranch. Can will, will you avocado advise them? Avocado <laughs> ranch, my friend. I would definitely advise. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. I, I had a VC to come out here. Um, you know, we were talking about financial tech companies and uh, I took him through some of the uh, vineyards and avocado orchards and he said, how do people make money on this? And I took him to an avocado ranch, uh, old retired couple I know. Uh, the land costs four hundred ninety thousand dollars, which is pretty inexpensive. Has forty nine fifty producing avocado trees. Guess how much money that yields? This old uh, retired couple. Man, I wouldn't even. <laughs> uh, Over three million dollars a year. Jesus. 
You want to know what they put into it? Uh, well, they have a growing season three, four times a year. Uh, they have a, 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 an incredibly intelligent, vibrant immigrant workforce that comes in and literally works these uh, fields for them. Uh, they have a couple of caretakers. The water is well water, which is deep, and they have rights to it, and they don't use a whole lot of water. They're using great technology. And uh, literally, you just care for the trees, and it's an incredible harvest for these people. Brian, uh, you're gonna, you're gonna, you should start an angelist uh, syndicate for... <laughs> Uh, farming and cows and avocado farms. Happened with his one VC, he actually bought uh, 16 acres of uh, avocado ranch, and yeah, it's incredibly. I'm telling you, uh, just take uh, take what works and just uh, create from, a parallel. Yeah, from you know, pay, I, from payments to <laughs> Tesla to avocado trees, huh? Well, <laughs> yeah. You know what? It's all, all right. it's all abstract currency in a sense, isn't it? A commodity yeah. or an abstract currency? Absolutely, sir. Guys, been Absolutely. A fantastic show. Another one. I love Wonderful. the eclectic nature of our topics. It's uh, <laughs> extremely entertaining to me, and I hope everyone else enjoyed. So, we'll call it a day, and hope everyone enjoyed the show. Take, you guys care. take care. Have a good one. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.